Stanford University. Well, welcome and thanks so much for spending a little hot afternoon here. Uh, I'm Nate Lewis. I'm a dearly departed Stanford faculty member. I used to be here from 1981 to 1988 um, across in mud chemistry. Still love coming back. Got to do more of it. I'm also the GSEP theme leader in solar energy. Just delighted to be a part of this great program. Um, what I was instructed and what we decided that these tutorials would be, would be to take practitioners in energy who weren't in the field and give them a basis to go into a GSIP symposium and mostly understand the state-of-the-art talks in the area. So that's what our marching orders was and that's what I have tried to do here for you. I've never given this before, probably will never give it again, so it's an experiment for both of us. If you're an expert and you think I'm going to talk about state-of-the-art cutting-edge expert stuff, then that's not what I'm going to do in solar today. I'm going to try to stick to my mission, which was to try to bring people up to speed as much as one can in an hour and a half in what are three very different areas that I'll talk about. Uh, a great resource is something you can download from the web called Basic Research Needs for Solar Energy Utilization. And this was the result of a workshop of over 200 people, scientists, solar scientists, in internationally that is part of the Department of Energy's workshop report series that was to be used to influence the budget and programs in DOE. Uh, they were largely successful in compiling both tutorial-based and up to state-of-the-art blueprints for what research in many different areas might be, including energy storage, nuclear, energy security. And this one, which I was honored to be the chair of the workshop and therefore the lead author on the report, was prepared about four or five years ago. But when I started to think about a reference for today that I could recommend to you is to a single place to turn to learn all about this area. There's nowhere, in my opinion, better than that one 200-page document that has tutorials, that has references to state-of-the-art. You'll find it as a blueprint for what research priorities and what research fields to work in in the desks of many researchers around the world who use it still today as this is what we should do in this area. This is what the gaps are in this area. And so it's a wonderful resource with lots of references in it to other material. Uh, the punchlines out of this that I'll get into detail is the sun is a singular solution to our energy needs. It is singular because many people don't realize just how much energy there is in that nuclear fusion reactor placed a safe 93 million miles away from us. Uh, in fact, more energy from the sun in one hour hits the earth than all the energy consumed on our planet in an entire year. Nothing else comes close. It's free of greenhouse gases and pollutants. Everybody has a chunk of it, enough in principle, to power any foreseeable future human-based energy economy for ever, basically. But there's an enormous gap between what we do now with it, our tiny use of it, which I'll tell you about, and what its potential would be. And it was the sense of this workshop that incremental advances would not be sufficient to bridge this gap. That we had to learn how to do things, some things that we simply don't know how to do now. For instance, store massive quantities of sunlight if we're to make a true energy system out of it, because my mantra is he that cannot store shall not have power after four. And the sun has this nasty little habit. Locally, it goes out every single night. We have to deal with that. And so we need, as well as scaling up the existing, now money-making, solar industry, to also, in parallel with that, do some research to address things that we simply don't know how to do now. 
In addition, that research is interdisciplinary and it's an area prime for where basic research and applied science should couple because after all, basic research in this area is only useful if it actually leads eventually to something that makes energy for somebody and delivers it to them if it's to be meaningful. Let me now go into more depth on those and in this brief introductory thing just give you a feeling for what the numbers behind those statements were. Uh, in barrels of oil equivalent and cubic feet of natural gas, put all those units into one common unit. Take all the joules of energy consumed in a year. Divide by the number of seconds in a year. Get the average consumption rate of energy. On our planet, it's now 15 terawatts. 15 trillion watts is what the average rate of energy consumption is. Add it all up from all primary energy. Most studies believe say that even with aggressive conservation due to population growth and economic growth, we might in principle hold this to double in 40 or 50 years what it is today. If we were so good at conserving energy that we held energy demand constant for the next 40 years, something the world has never done in a single year in human history, we would still need on the order of 15 or 20 trillion watts equivalent of energy to meet global demand. If you hold it at 30 terawatts, double, of course, right now 85% of that energy comes from fossil energy. Some people are worried about energy security, others are worried about the environmental consequences of adding all that carbon dioxide from consumption of all that fossil fuel to the air. You can argue whether or not we're going to run out of fossil energy or first run out of air in which to put all that combustion product, but one way or the other, there's a gotcha there. But there is the scale issue. If you hold this to double, and then on top of that, you save as much energy as all the energy we use today combined, you still have to make 10 or 15 trillion watts of carbon-free energy, carbon-neutral energy, if you want to cut CO2 emissions to this 80% reduction within our lifetimes. So scale is important in all of energy and it's no less important in solar. By any measure, you need to bring online something like 15 trillion watts of carbon-free power and remember CO2 emissions at least are cumulative. Maybe oil depletion isn't, but CO2 emissions certainly are because the lifetime in the air is about a thousand years or more. That means if you wait 40 more years to bring it online, you have 40 more years of emissions under your belt that simply do not go away. So that means that you have to, if your goal is to avoid that, you can pass a law of politics that says we'll delay greenhouse gas emissions until unemployment goes down X and Y, but the physics of our planet cannot be repealed and it will not delay the rate of accumulation of that CO2 no matter what we legislate. Well, if you want to meet that gap, let's just tell you how big it is before I go on here. One, uh, I'm not for or against, and you can see a bigger talk about mine on energy uh, for any particular choice. I don't have a favorite or not. But let's just take the view that you wanted to do this with nuclear power to close that carbon neutral, carbon free energy gap, 15 trillion watts. Well, you could do it that way. In fact, it's arguably the only technology we now have that can scale to that level. Nuclear power plants are built safely now, commissioned by the NRC. They make a gigawatt of electrical output. Quick math says you want 15 trillion watts, you have to build a nuclear power plant every single day somewhere on our planet starting today for the next 40 straight years. Okay? That's the arithmetic of the scale of energy. It's not 46 nuclear power plants like we heard about in the presidential campaign. That is not even close. And by the way, since they only last 40 years, by the time you're done, you have to start recommissioning the first one. So I like to say you're building a nuclear power plant every day forever. If you don't do that, you better get it somewhere else. You could, in principle, bury all the CO2, carbon capture and storage. If it works technically, we should be trying that. We don't know it works. We don't know you can bury that much of it and not have it come back to haunt you for a thousand years at 0.1% leak rate a year. People might say it doesn't leak, but we just heard that before and look what just happened. <laughs> if you want to get it somewhere else, this is the simple arithmetic. Uh, the solar system champion energy source is the sun. 
Nothing else even comes remotely close. It's pretty simple. You might be able to piece your way together a few terawatts here and there, but it is very hard to see, even if you built a nuclear power plant every week starting today somewhere in the world, that would be 10% of the problem. If you sequestered all the coal-fired power plants, it's another 20% of the problem. You've left 70% of the problem on the table. And that's assuming you keep energy demand constant. If it goes up to 28 terawatts, you've got to make two nuclear power plants a day to fill the gap. The big other card we have is that the sun gives us 120,000 terawatts. Okay. So it's pretty clear, at least to me, that we have three big cards, and we should, at various stages of maturity, right now we don't use the sun very much because it's too expensive. We can't afford to do it. And you can argue that maybe if this is a task at which we don't want to fail, that it's probably the case that we can't afford very soon not afford to do it. Here's a map, and this map also tells you about scale. If you had a 10% solar conversion efficiency system, it could be photovoltaics with storage, it could be miraculous crop biofuels that work 50 times better than the current ones do, or something in between. But just taking the resource and taking how much sunlight hits a representative mid-latitude and saying I'm going to take 10 net percent of that and I want to know the area needed to cover to power all the United States' energy, not just electricity, all its energy, forever, that's the box. It's 1.7% of the United States' area. It's equivalent to all the nation's numbered highway system. Good news is, I've never met anybody that actually lived there. And you make a lot of money. This little kerner would make so much money that they could be their own member state of OPEC. Bad news is, it's not a small area by most energy standard means. Uh, to be fair, if you had to build a nuclear power plant every day, you have to put up the equivalent of solar if that's what you want to do, and it's the equivalent of, we have a state law that says we're going to put up a million solar roofs in 10 years, most aggressive law of any state in the United States. We're proud of that in California. But the arithmetic is you have to do one of them every single day, starting today, a million roofs every day somewhere in our country, if you want to cover that much area by 2050. Okay? So, we need to think about technology that can get to that scale. To a scale that is commensurate with rolling out stuff equivalent to printing the newspaper or rolling out carpet. It is very hard to see how you could install glass panels, treating them like museum pieces, and a million solar roofs every single day. In five years, we'd be a billion behind. Now, of course, there aren't that many roofs in the United States because you need to cover more area than just everybody's roof if you want to make all of our energy. It's a little bit smaller if you put it all in New Mexico. I just picked a representative mid-latitude because, of course, even though people um, think that they might devote the area in New Mexico to do it, there's no way to store or distribute that to people that need it elsewhere, so you'd never really do it that way. And then if you did, if there were one cloudy day, which I assure you there are many in monsoon season, you know, you need a big red switch with the letters United States of America on it and some guy to flip it for three days, it doesn't work. All right, so you have to distribute this stuff. But that's the scale issue. Okay, now there's a cost issue. The scale also dictates something to do with cost. Uh, let me tell you one more thing about scale there. So, compared to fossil energy, which is, after all, and nuclear, the most concentrated energy source is in the nucleus of the atom and fission and fusion, and then fossil energy in the chemical bonds of oil, coal, and gas. And then after that is sunlight. On average, day-night average, representative mid-latitude, solar flux is about 230 watts per square meter. The Average wind energy at the surface of the Earth is 2 watts per square meter, not 200, is 2. The average geothermal energy is 0 0.05 watts per square meter at the surface of the Earth. That's about all you need to know because when you're mining something, if it's more dilute, it's more expensive to mine it and it's no different in mining energy resources. So, of course, 
when sunlight is only 200 watts per meter squared, you are mining it over a big area compared to going and digging the concentrated solar energy stored in chemical bonds, which means that it's going to cost more for a while, at least. In fact, if you just take a square meter and say, if I make 10% of the sunlight that hits it converted into energy, in this case electricity, uh, which is not to be confused with energy since electricity is high value energy, but let's just take electricity first. If I took 10% of the energy that hit at that representative box in Kansas and it cost me $300 per square meter of materials plus installation costs and I got 10% of that, then that defines how much energy I'm going to produce to you. Because over 30 or 40 years, I know I'm going to get 10% of the joules in that area as my product. Now I've told you how much I have to sell you the product for so that I can break even with my materials and installation costs. And if something costs $300 per square meter to make and install, which is a factor of two less than what solar panels now cost, to make and install, then you have to sell it for 15 or 20 cents a kilowatt hour just to break even. All right, so that's the arithmetic. You can do better, but the, the, the real amortization is a dollar a watt peak if it were full cost, including installation, which this isn't chart used for, but I use it for that, would translate to fully amortized of about five cents a kilowatt hour. So that's the Rosetta Stone of conversion. It may be six or seven, it depends on the efficiency, but roughly we'll call it five. So if you want to make competitive electricity, you have to be on this line somewhere, and solar cells panels are right now on this line. You have to really up their efficiency and or really lower their cost, one or the other. This is just given by the physics of the area of insulation that you need to cover and the fraction of energy you're going to get out of it. Pretty simple. Okay. Now there are several strategies. One is just learn how to scale up and manufacture systems that cost a lot less and hope you can keep their efficiency. The second is make systems that are really efficient. And of course, if you need to go down by a factor of five or 10 and your efficiency is already 10% and as we'll see, there's a thermodynamic limit for simple systems of only 32%, you cannot get there just by learning how to manufacture these things better. You have to develop systems that are also breaking this fundamental efficiency limit. Now everything I've told you so far applies to every man-made system and the arithmetic really isn't any different for biofuels which are just nature's solar conversion system. It's just that the economics are a little different and you don't think about installed cost of materials per square meter, you think about farming per square meter, but it's really no different. You're getting out a certain fraction of the energy in the case of biofuels as we'll see, the fastest growing plants in all the material, in all the bio stock, harvest less than 1% of the energy of sunlight that hits that square acre over an average year. So they're very inefficient. It's just that they can and sometimes be sufficiently low cost to be interesting. And they store the energy in an energy dense form, carbon, carbon bonds, why we care about it. All right. So there are three different permutations to think about to utilize the sun in general. One is make electricity. Uh, I'll tell you about that, how solar cells work, what their governing principles are, and then bring you up to the conceptual state of the art. Uh, I'll tell you about solar thermal, which is make heat. Focus the sunlight just the way we did as kids with the magnifying glass to fry ants. In this case, we're going to heat up a thermal fluid like oil or a molten salt. And then when it gets hot, we'll run a turbine with it, make electricity, or maybe convert it directly to chemical fuel. The third is to do what nature does, which is to do the process of photosynthesis. When you take that energy in the sun and make directly a storable chemical fuel, nature makes a fuel we can't use, lignocellulose. We got to go get it. We lose all the energy in malignin. You're lucky if you get a tiny fraction of it in the cellulose converted to ethanol. And so there are problems, but, and there are other problems I'll talk about. Plants are not efficient energy conversion machines. They were never evolved to be that. They were evolved to look pretty and reproduce. And so it's possible to think about, although you have a proof of concept in that birds have feathers, 
The Wright brothers didn't use feathers when they flew, and it's possible to think about designing a human-based artificial system that directly does what a plant does, takes fuel, makes fuel from sunlight. Uh, I'll talk about that too. So these are the three different areas that I'll try to cover. Perspective right now, solar electricity total on our planet makes, instead of 13 terawatts, about 0.001 terawatts. So that's the scale we're at now. And part of the reason for that is even though we developed solar cells 1955, first one still works from Bell Labs, because of that cost of materials and installation, it's about 20 cents a kilowatt hour right now. You can argue if it's 15 or 30, depends on the siting, but 20 is a good average number. And people that say when it gets down to a nickel a kilowatt hour, it will be grid parity are completely wrong. No such thing as grid parity for an intermittent resource that goes out every night. Right? Because unless you can store it, all you can do is shave from peak off of somebody else's base load. You still have to back that up 100% with some storage because if there's one cloudy day or every night, you've got to find a way to still deliver energy with 99% reliability by regulation onto the grid. So it is not the case that intermittent, a nickel a kilowatt hour, means somehow that you obviate all of the other energy technologies that would be installed for electricity. Not the case. So we need to understand that there's a different economic value proposition for, the, for intermittent resources than for baseload ones. For solar thermal, right now it's mostly space heating and home water heating. It's 0.002 terawatts. You'd like to grow that to a lot, a few terawatts. And solar fuels right now are 1.4 terawatts in the unsustainable consumption of wood and biofuels for heating purposes, cooking purposes in the third world. You know, we still get 10% of our global energy by burning wood somewhere on our planet, unsustainably. Right? And again, all of these would have to be scaled up enormously the amount of sustainable biomass is much less than that, about 0.2 terawatts. Okay, so let's look at solar electricity first. Then I'll turn to solar thermal, I'm going to do this in a little reverse order, and then to solar fuels. Okay, so the first thing we need to, what's a solar cell do? Consistent absorber that takes the solar photons from the solar spectrum and converts it into an electrical current flow. It doesn't store it, it just produces electricity. No moving parts, wonderful thing. One of the magical steps here is how in the world does that material know which end is up? Literally which end is up? When these photo excited charges create an excited state that's an electron promoted from its low ground state level to its excited state level, that's not sufficient to obtain a directed current through the circuit. Because if it doesn't know which way's up, then half the time this current's going to go to the left and half the time it's going to go to the right, and in the end you have no net current flowing through your system. I don't know why anybody always lights a light bulb with this because when the sun's out, the last thing you need to do is light your light, so we should run a fan. But you can't run the fan, especially today. You can't run the fan if the current is half the time going to the left and half the time going to the right. So solar materials all have two parts. One is the absorber in order to optimally absorb the solar photons. The other is a built-in asymmetry. In plants, that asymmetry, as we'll see, is at the pigments in the photosynthetic reaction center. In photovoltaics, it's because there are two different materials or two different material types, one on top of the other, so that the system knows left from right or up from down. And so the charges are either attracted or repelled to that metallurgical interface by an electric field. And the trick is to build in that field strong enough that these carriers, which won't know which way to go, all figure out they need to go either up or down. So they don't short circuit the system. Okay. Now what choice of materials are there? Well, this is given entirely again by the physics of the spectrum of the sun. If you look up from the earth on a sunny day like today, 
uh, you will get this so-called air mass 1.5 solar spectrum. Uh, for those people that need to know what the air mass 1.5 is, that is defined as 1 over the cosine of the angle. And so that's about 30 degrees off of normal incidence, so maybe it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And air mass 1.0 would be the spectrum at 90 degrees, because it's 1 over cosine of 1 is straight up. Right? And the spectrum changes a little bit, of course, as the sun goes through time of day. People have to pick a standard. You can look both of them up. They're not too much different. This is the 1.5, so kind of 2 in the afternoon standard. And it's normalized to a value of 100 milliwatts per square centimeter. Good round number, representative of what you'd have today outside if you took a power meter out there and pointed it just about an hour ago at the sun. Okay. Of course, because the sun is a 6400 degree or so black body, filtered by a few kilometers of the Earth's atmosphere, then there are dips in this where the gases in the atmosphere absorb like water vapor predominantly, and also CO2. And this is the infrared, where most of the heating occurs. Swimming pools get heated from those photons. And then here's the visible region from 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers. And then there's a fall off in the ultraviolet, both from the sun's black body temperature and also filtered especially by ozone in the stratosphere and in Southern California by ozone in the troposphere and nitrous oxides. Uh, this spectrum has a fundamental limitation with it. Uh, when you build a material to absorb sunlight, there's a characteristic property called its band gap. For the chemists, think about a continuum of levels that are the highest occupied set of levels, and then a gap to the lowest unoccupied set of levels, just due to making chemical bonds. The material scientists know these band gaps. Insulators have a large band gap, metals have none, and semiconductors are in between the two in that continuum. If the band gap is very large, say three electron volts, corresponding to a photon energy of about 350 nanometers, then when you absorb a photon of 350 nanometers energy, there's a lot of energy in that excited state in order to drive an electrical load. It can produce 3 eV of voltage, minus some entropy losses, but not much current, because there aren't many solar photons with the energy sufficient to promote an electron from this energy level up to that one. All of the ones that have lower energy just go right through the material. They're too low energy to be absorbed. So you get a lot of energy per absorbed photon, but not many absorbed photons. If the band gap is really small, the limit being the black asphalt we use to make the roads with essentially no band gap, it absorbs all the solar photons. But if you have a very small band gap, first of all, again, the ones that are redder than that, lower in energy, don't get absorbed. But what happens is the ones that are higher in energy in this continuum, their electron energy gets rattled down to the lowest available level very quickly before the charges can move anywhere in the solid. So this is all lost as heat. This is just lost as transparent non-absorption. So here, you have a lot of photons absorbed, but not much energy produced in the circuit per photon absorbed. So this band gap is too small. And just taking the derivative of this spectrum with respect to energy, it is easy to establish what the maximum efficiency point is for this compromise between absorption and energy per absorbed photon. And that turns out to be about 880 nanometers, 1.4 electron volts. It's a relatively weak maximum. So you can do very well with materials at about 1.1 EV, 1100 nanometers. That's silicon's band gap. You can do perfectly with gallium arsenide's 1.4 EV band gap or zinc phosphide's 1.4 EV band gap, or cadmium tellurides. And you can do pretty well at 1.7 EV. By the time you're up at two electron volts, about 550 nanometers, your maximum theoretical efficiency is already cut down by a factor of about two. And as you go bluer from that in absorption, higher in energy, you take a more severe decline. 
Right. So this immediately tells you something about the material's choices. It also tells you that plants, which are green, that have a 670 nanometer absorption in chlorophyll are not optimum energy conversion machines from the point of view of just looking at the physics of the solar spectrum. They should be black, not green, if they wanted to be optimally absorbing in this inner conversion. They have other reasons why they're green. We'll talk about that. But they're not optimum, that's for sure. Okay. Now, what materials do we use? And how does this process work? So now I'm going to go in to bring you to try to up to speed so you can understand photovoltaic talks. Let's suppose that we have a semiconductor which has these filled levels, the highest occupied levels called the valence band, this energy gap, and the lowest unoccupied levels called the conduction band. At absolute zero, there are no electrons at energies in orbitals any higher than the highest occupied one because there's no thermal energy to excite them. If you define the Fermi level, which is, by definition, the energy at which the probability of finding an electron is 0.5, that's the definition of the Fermi level from statistical mechanics, then it will be halfway in between these two. Now notice that the Fermi level has a value at which in energy there is no actual state having that energy. But the energies here have a probability of being occupied of exactly one because they're all filled. The orbitals here have a probability of being occupied of exactly zero. When you draw the probability of finding an electron, it goes from one to zero and it crosses the value of a half, therefore halfway in between. It is perfectly acceptable and is in fact the rule that the Fermi level has the value of wherever it has the value of the probability of finding an electron being a half, even if there are no actual states at that Fermi level. Now, of course, at a finite temperature, uh, you're going to have electrons up there, but also vacancies down there because you'll thermally excite them, and the more you'll thermally excite will depend on how hot you get this relative to the band gap. Okay? But the Fermi level will stay in the middle for a so-called intrinsic solid. Because if you thermally knocked an electron from here up to here, although it's now more likely to find an electron here, it's more likely you didn't find it there because you pulled it out of this orbital and put it in that orbital. And so to first order, the Fermi level stays just in the middle. There's a little KT correction based on entropy. But to first order, it stays in the middle. Okay. Now, we don't like that because we want to direct this system somehow. And so we dope this material. For a material like silicon, which Every silicon atom has four silicons chemically bonded to it and is sp3 hybridized in my chem 1 class. And you can pull out that silicon atom and put in a phosphorus atom. Phosphorus comes with five valence electrons. Silicon comes with four. That extra electron in the phosphorus is loosely held. And so it will thermally be ionized and rattle around and add an extra electron to the lattice in the same way that if another person came into the room with all the seats filled, the only way for them to have a person move would be to crawl on all your shoulders and get to the front. Okay, so it adds an electro electron to the lattice, and that means there's an extra negative type charge, an electron, moving through the system. Because it is added to the level where there was an empty state, now the Fermi level is up near the conduction band, because if it's zero here, if it's one probability of finding an electron here, and there's also probability of finding it here some of the time, now instead of crossing the half point there, it's the half points way up toward that Fermi level. And in fact, these statistics are well known. You can read a semiconductor physics textbook to learn all about them. But qualitatively, this is what happens. If, on the other hand, you take a semiconductor like silicon, and instead of putting phosphorus in that adds an electron, you put in a boron that removes an electron, because boron only comes with three electrons, not four. Now every site where there's a silicon, instead where there's a boron, you've sucked an electron out of the lattice. It would be equivalent to having all the seats filled and having one empty seat by somebody leaving. And then if you all want to move a human from the front to the back, you have to shift to create the vacancy like the puzzle game where the empty seat moves. Really, humans are still moving, but it looks to the observer like it's an empty seat moving. It looks like a hole, a bubble, is moving from front to back. And so that's called the positive type doping. Now, because we pulled electrons out of where they were before, the halfway point is down toward where they mostly were instead of up toward where we added them. And this is called p-type. 
The Fermi level is statistically thermodynamically the same thing as the electrochemical potential of a material. At equilibrium, a material that contacts another material, they equilibrate until there's only one Fermi level. By definition, because otherwise they're out of equilibrium if they have two different Fermi levels, by definition. Okay? So now what happens? Let's suppose we take that semiconductor, and in this example we'll make it n-type, but it could be p-type. And we're going to do that because we want to raise that Fermi level up to add electrons to the solid to make it more conductive and to give us a driving force to do something with that extra set of charge carriers. Now, in most solar cells, you actually don't contact it with a metal. You would contact that absorber with another material of the opposite carrier type. If this was n-type silicon, you would put p-type silicon on the front. The physics is the same. It's just easier to explain if I put a metal there. Okay? But you need this asymmetry in order to establish left from right. So now we're going to see how that happens. This metal has its own Fermi level. That's the orbitals at which the metal, like a piece of gold, have all its orbitals occupied and then empty above that. And it might be there. And we dope the silicon to make it there. But now if I take that dope piece of silicon and that metal and I put them together, I touch them, or I evaporate them, or I contact them, they are not in equilibrium anymore because by definition this Fermi level is different than that Fermi level. And so they won't stay that way. They will move their Fermi levels until they are equal everywhere in the system. That happens very quickly with two conductors, in fact in a microsecond or less. And you can think of these Fermi levels just like the level of buckets of water either in a bucket or a bucket connected to a swimming pool or an ocean. In this case, for a metal, um, you can put in a lot of water and not change the level of the water in the Pacific Ocean. And the same thing happens when you add or pull out electrons from a metal. Its capacity to accept and remove electrons per unit of energy is very large. But in a semiconductor, because there were no states here, if you pull a few charges out of that conduction band, the probability of finding an electron plummets rapidly. And so you don't have to move many charges out of this solid in order to move its Fermi level down. And so what happens in this case is the Fermi level of the metal hardly moves up, but the Fermi level of the semiconductor moves all the way down. Now it doesn't matter if I had two doped solids, one would move up and one would move down, they'd end up in the middle. It's just easier to see in this limit what happens. What happens as a result of this? This initially neutral solid, which had as many electrons as it had electron vacancies, it was neutral, is now no longer neutral. If I look at this under a microscope, I see the dividing line, and electrons have left this phase. This phase is now positively charged. And electrons have gone to this phase. This phase is now negatively charged. Okay. There is now an electric field-based asymmetry in this entire device because this phase is positively charged, this phase is negatively charged. Now, what will happen is it's not going to stay this way because these positive charges want to snuggle up next to the negative charges so that their positive and negative attraction is maximized and that happens when the distance is the smallest between opposite charge carriers. So all the negatives on the surface of the metal, because metals don't support electric fields, go to the surface of the metal. All the positives try to get as close as they can to the surface of the semiconductor, but they can't all sit on the surface because they reside on the places these electrons left. They were plucked off of those phosphorus atoms. And if we don't put many of them in the lattice, we have to reach further in to get all the phosphorus atoms plucked off with electrons. Okay? This distance, therefore, is controllable by how much we dope this. And instead of being one atom, like a metal, can be on the order of a tenth of a micron. Right? That's really good because what happens then is if you pulled out electrons for on the order of a tenth of a micron, then it's easy to show that if you have this charge density from Maxwell's equations, you integrate it once to get an electric field, you integrate it twice to get the electric potential. But you don't need to do this to just know that if there's a sheet of positive charge, if I have a test point charge, as I push it through this interface, 
it's going to see more and more negative charge the closer it gets to that negatively charged metal. And so I'm going to have to work to keep pushing it and push and push and push. And finally, when I break through, then it's free sailing for me. But it's clearly worked for me to take a test negative charge and push it through this electrified interface to get it to the other side. Alternatively, if I took light and created an excited electron, it rolls down the hill, it knows left from right. It doesn't want to go toward the negative charges. There's the built-in electric field driven asymmetry that tells photo excited carriers that there is a right side of the device and there's a left side and in this sign of the effect, don't go to the right, go to the left because you're repelled by that extra negative charge on the surface of the metal. This field strength can be very large. It can be on the order of a volt dropped over on the order of a tenth of a micron. So it's on the order of 10 to the fifth volts per centimeter is the static maximum electric field. And charge carriers and solids will see that very big field and be separated never to recombine very quickly within a picosecond. So when they're excited, they know left from right and they move and they don't back react and that creates the current throughout the circuit that makes the solar cell work. Okay, good. Now if all there was to that was creating the current, we would always get all the current and all the voltage in a real solar cell. But for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. That material is trying to oppose what the light is doing to it with its best efforts. It's trying to recombine those carriers because its natural equilibrium state is to not have any excess carriers on it. When you shine light on the system, you've created a photostationary state. It's out of equilibrium. It's like you're heating up a liquid or the way I tell my students in a class I teach. It's like somebody's dumping in blue dye in one side of a pot and somebody else is dumping in red dye and you've got to keep dumping in dye because there's a drain in the middle and it's trying to drain out dye through the bucket and you've got to keep adding it and the bigger the drain, the more you've got to keep adding to keep the color the same. And that's just what's happening with the sun and photons. It's adding photons like adding dye and if the material is trying to recombine them, it's draining out those photons and you want to build up the concentration of electrons and holes as big as possible to get as much current and voltage out of the system. So you want to minimize that drain, the size of the drain. What's the drain? The drain is due to carriers that would be in their excited states that want to move in the solid and get to that external circuit getting lost on their way. There are many ways they can get lost. They could decide to go the wrong way. There's some probability that they will go up over this thermal barrier given by the height of that barrier and the Boltzmann constant. They could decide along the way that they could go down and recombine anyway. They could get here and when they go this way with holes coming the other way it's like two crossing trains. There's some probability that when they go to the intersection, the electron will find the hole and then they'll recombine. Sometimes they emit light. That's good if you're trying to make a light emitting diode. It's bad if you're trying to make a solar cell. Okay. They're actually the inverse process, right? One, you put in voltage and get a light out. The other, you put in light and you get voltage out. So good LEDs are bad solar cells. Good solar cells are bad LEDs. Same physics. Okay. What's the fundamental properties of this loss mechanism? What happens is you, when you build up electrons that you're adding dye and you're building up electrons in this material, it's going to try to oppose that. And you can see that happening because as you add more electrons, then it's naturally because this material was positively charged. As you add more electrons to the material, it's going to neutralize some of that positive charge. That's going to reduce the barrier that we built up in the first place. And so it's going to make it easier for electrons to go up and over the barrier the wrong way. The other way you can make it easier to make them go up the barrier the wrong way is you could decide you wanted to actually add a bias with a battery or you could have a resistor in there that draws a load. And that's what we want to do with a real solar cell. We want it to do work for us. The more work we demand, the less carriers will be able to give us that work. We're asking to filter their energies by the amount of work we demand. When we only demand a little bit of work, a lot of carriers are capable of doing that. When we demand a lot of work, only a few of them are capable of doing that. In fact, you can see that if we raise this voltage up and up and up, 
the amount of carriers that can go the wrong way will increase exponentially by the Boltzmann equation. Okay? And that means that instead of going this way, they are flowing the wrong way over the not very good dam that we have built. And the wrong way current is going exponentially with the voltage, just from the Boltzmann equation. What this leads to is it leads to a so-called diode characteristic. Uh, this is a rotten exponential, my hand sketch in PowerPoint. I could do better, but it's okay. In this forward bias so-called region, the current, the wrong way current, is going up exponentially with voltage because they're leaking over the barrier and we're helping them go over exponentially every time we demand more and more work get done. Now on top of that, we're shining light and the light is trying to move carriers the right way in the face of fish going the wrong way. And sometimes we would care about the net salmon going upstream. Right? Some are going right way, some are going the wrong way. We can't tell the difference, they're all electrons. All we can count is at the end is how many fish swim through the gate, which is how much current goes through the back of the wire. Right? And so on top of a constant photocurrent, we have this increasing dark current. Okay? What this means is that the characteristic of a real solar cell are that in the dark there's this wrong way current that goes exponentially with voltage. Then there's the right way current that adds on to that and it creates three important properties. One is at short circuit when you just connect them together and there's no voltage being produced but the current is freely flowing, that photo current, it's going the right way, nothing's going the wrong way, we're getting it all. That's the maximum current you get called the short circuit current. It's limited by how well the material absorbs sunlight and how much sunlight's above its band gap. Now as we add more and more voltage, we turn that filter up and we push carriers the wrong way, let them flow over the dam the wrong way, we start to get more and more flowing the wrong way until the amount flowing the wrong way just equals the amount flowing the right way and then the net amount of current that goes through the external circuit is exactly zero because we're still collecting photocurrent, it's just that it's exactly opposed by carriers going the other way and so the net amount of current through our wire reads exactly zero on our ammeter. Exactly as many is going to the right is going to the left. At that point, we develop a voltage at open circuit, but there's no current that flows. Okay? And then, somewhere in between, there's a trade between getting all the current and no voltage and getting all the voltage and no current because power is the product of voltage times current and that's called the maximum power point. And theoretically, this is where you want to run this system. You want to run it where you're getting the maximum power out, which is the product at maximum of the current times the voltage. The ratio of this point as it defines a rectangle relative to the ideal rectangle of the ideal current times the ideal voltage is often called the fill factor. So when you hear people talk about the fill factor, it's how close this maximum point is to the theoretical operating point if you could get all the current at all the voltage for that device. Theoretically, the fill factor can't be higher than 86% because it's just a property of what an exponential looks like. Okay, good. I've covered that. So, what's the name of the game? The name of the game is, ah, let's go back, name of the game is make really pure material. Because if it's really pure, then it can absorb light and all the carriers will move the right way and hardly any will move the wrong way. And in fact, the limit of moving the wrong way is given just by the radiative recombination limit. When all the carriers are emitting photons of light, you can't do any better than that because whatever they're absorbing is basically making them emit the Einstein coefficients so-called of spontaneous absorption and emission are symmetrical and equal. And so when the quantum yield for emission is 100%, it's operating like an LED and you can't do better than that. That means you've turned off every other loss mechanism. Okay? But no solar cell ever operates there because it's way too expensive to make material that pure and actually use them. And so when you have less purity, there are ways that those carriers will get lost. They can recombine from traps. 
that are either in the space charge region or in the bulk or at the surface or typically some combination of them. The reason we distinguish them is because they actually have different statistics. If they're in the field region, the probability of an electron and a hole getting together is different statistically than if they're in this neutral region than if they're at the surface. So there are different radiative laws that tell you what the carrier recombination statistics are, but the fundamental concept is the same. You want to avoid traps. This is the reason solar cells cost so much money, because you have to purify that piece of silicon, which takes 200 microns to absorb the sunlight, sufficiently pure that these excited carriers can make it all the 200 microns to get to the interface to figure out left from right. If on the way they recombine, all they do is make heat. And that's why that piece of silicon that goes up on your roof is what I tell people the purest material they will ever see or touch. It's pure to a part per billion or better because if you don't purify it that much, then carriers just recombine even if they were absorbed and all you get is heat. And this is the fundamental trait. Um, materials that absorb light pretty well that are cheap don't move carriers very far. And nobody has yet figured out a good sweet spot around that. Thin films like cadmium telluride, First Solar is the leading cadmium telluride based thin film solar company. Cadmium telluride absorbs all the sunlight in about 2 microns instead of 200. So you'd think that that means it's easier to make it pure to the level needed, but the reason it absorbs light very strongly is the same reason it emits light very strongly. And so it's just as hard to first order to purify cadmium telluride to the levels needed as it is to purify silicon to the levels needed. It has the advantage in principle that it could be processed like a thin film and rolled up, but to first order it's got the same cost per watt. It's not as efficient. It doesn't cost as much to make as a crystal of silicon. Crystals of silicon still have 90% of the solar market. It would be great if people found a way to, instead of growing single crystals, to take little particles of that same material with the right absorption properties where electrons could be moved in every crystal, but have them like kernels of Rice Krispies move electrons from kernel to kernel. The problem here is that the grain boundaries are places where those atoms know they're not in the bulk anymore. In the bulk, every atom of silica knows it's got four nearest neighbors. At the surface, it knows it doesn't have four. Sometimes it may only have two. And it was that strong bonding to all the four other silicons that made it have no defects in the first place that defined its electronic structure, which we now destroyed by putting it at the surface. Now there's no law of physics that says that we can't develop termination mechanisms that allow electrons to hop from particle to particle without getting lost at the surface of each one of these kernels. If you could do that, then you would have a way to take really cheap material that wasn't a single crystal and still take advantage of its ability to move electrons from particle to particle and absorb them and in principle create a material that was just like the particles in the pigment and paint. This is, if I had a nickel for every time somebody now used the term we coined of solar paint, I would be richer than a solar cell company that actually tries to make one, but that would be a great thing. People are also trying to use organic materials that can be processed like plastics, unlike brittle, pure materials like inorganic light absorbers like silicon. The leading candidate there is this blend of a conducting organic polymer, polyphenylene vinylene, that conducts holes, and a version of C60 buckyballs that conducts electrons. This blend was discovered in large part by Alan Heeger, who was a Nobel laureate at UC Santa Barbara for discovering in part the first conducting polymers. And it does make a material that in a blend of these two has an asymmetry because there are places that separate electrons from holes that can be made into sheets of essentially plastic like Polaroid film that do act as photovoltaic devices that can be rolled out. 
The problem is that the mobility in organic materials, the ability to move electric charge per unit of applied voltage, is much lower than it is in inorganic materials. After all, we know you want to conduct electricity, you put a piece of copper wire there and not a piece of insulating salt. And an organic material is in between those two, but what that means fundamentally is because you need to apply more electric field to separate that charge over a given time is that it's more difficult or you waste more energy in order to do that asymmetry in the first place that you need to tell the system left from right. So the fundamental name of the game in organic materials is how do you separate this charge in the first place? That charge that won't separate by itself is called an exciton and it takes a lot of energy to separate that exciton and therefore let it know left from right. In some cases almost half of the energy in that exciton is needed in order to separate it. And if you don't separate it, it just recombines. Okay? So due to the inherent low mobilities of organic materials compared to inorganic solids, uh, these materials have shown promise for processing but not for efficiency yet. The record is a small area, 7% efficient little teeny test device that isn't very stable over the long term. That doesn't mean there isn't promise here in principle. It does mean that there's a fundamental barrier that we will have to overcome to make it really make a difference. Okay. Ooh, there's one missing there. Okay. This idea of making interpenetrating networks that don't make carriers move a long distance but make them move only a short distance instead of having to go all the way from the bottom to the top, maybe they're absorbed in this C60 and they just move sideways a short distance and then if this is all connected like strands of spaghetti and this is all connected like strands of spaghetti but what has to happen is this can't touch the back and this can't touch the front because if it did they would just run around and short circuit themselves has to happen magically when you gamish them together and this C60 PPV has the system just set up that when you do it the right way you can make one of these things that works like that. Okay. There are other approaches. One of them is to make nanorods. Mike McGeehy here really first developed this idea and is still running with it very fast and impressively of using oriented phases like titanium dioxide that's clear and doesn't absorb the light but filling it with organic material because after all, this exciton diffusion length is very short, maybe only 10 nanometers. So if you made a planar solar cell out of it, only the first 10 nanometers would generate carriers all the way to the surface. The rest would absorb light, but it would be dead. They would never make it to get to the surface. You might as well not have it. But if everything is within 10 nanometers of being collected, then you could collect them all. Okay? This actually works. It works very well. There is a problem. There's always problems with everything. In this case is because there's more internal surface area and the surface area is where there's all these atoms with dangling bonds and unless you find ways to fool them into thinking they're in the bulk, you get a lot of recombination. So you get a lot of collection of the photocarriers but you get a lot of carriers going the wrong way at all these interfaces. So they aren't very efficient yet. Okay. That's kind of the basics of what people are thinking about on not violating the efficiency limits and trying to make materials that could be made cheaply. Um, there's a second approach. Now actually I need to tell you the limit. That kind of Rosetta Stone from that band gap limit, if you were at the optimum band gap of 1.4 EV, there are these two trades. All the energies below 1.4 EV aren't absorbed. All the photons of higher energy than 1.4 EV are thermalized down to 1.4 EV. That's two cuts already. Okay? You've cut out half of the light because it isn't absorbed. You've cut out another quarter of the photon energy because it was absorbed, but it wasn't just right at the gap. It was higher and it rattled down and you lost that. And so for a single band gap device at optimum, it's easy to tell from the derivative of that solar spectrum that the maximum theoretical efficiency is 32%. So this is an interesting kind of engineering problem in that in most engineering classes if you tell people build a system and they come back and say it's 5% efficient, you give them an F because they wasted 95%. Right? 
But you're in the game in solar if you have something that's 5 or 8 or 10 percent efficient, even if you waste 90 percent of the solar energy. Good news is that's because there's so much of it, you can waste 90 percent and still make a lot of energy. Bad news is the more you waste, the more land you've got to cover and the cheaper the stuff has to be. Right? Okay. And that was to get into that zone of make it cheaper but keep the efficiency about the same. Now there are other concepts. The other concepts involve really up the efficiency. Maybe you only have to make it half as cheap if I can make the efficiency three times bigger. So how would you ever think about beating this single band gap efficiency limit? Which, by the way, was first analyzed by Bill Shockley and Queezer, called the Shockley-Queezer limit, the same Shockley that won the Nobel Prize at Bell Labs for the transistor. Um, and when he was here at Shockley Semiconductor, realized you could make solar cells out of the same material and analyze their properties. So he developed the theory for that limit, as I just told you. Well, one way is to develop materials that don't rattle that electron energy down very quickly, but beat it and eject it into vacuum. Now, you have to have all this light absorption very close to a vacuum to do that. And Nick Meloch here has proposed a system, just appeared recently in science, that might in fact do just that. If you could get the energy out of the electrons in these so-called hot carriers, because they're hot in thermal energy and you don't let that be dissipated as heat, you can capture it, then you could use a very small band get material and absorb all the sunlight and get all the energy out of it in the excited state somewhere with a series of different metal contacts. And you could have, in principle, extremely high efficiency. Now, wiring up all these independent metal contacts to each one getting its own electron energy out is a neat trick that no one has yet done. Getting all the surfaces right near a vacuum sufficient that the electrons can move to the vacuum and not all rattle down in a real absorber that's really thick enough to absorb all the sunlight is something no one's yet done. Okay? So, there is physics that says it's not impossible, but that's only the denominator of the cost per watt. That's watts, that's not cost. Right? We'll see. There are instead these processes called multiple exciton generation. When if you create an electron, let's say we create an electron that has twice the energy of this fundamental gap. What it can do is instead of just making heat, it could knock another electron that was here in the ground state up to the excited state and lose half that energy. Now you get two for one, right? You kind of doubled down, right? You took one that was twice the energy and you got two that were just at the fundamental energy, right? It's called multiple exciton generation. This phenomenon exists and in fact was recently demonstrated only in systems that slow down this thermalization a lot. And the way to slow this down is because there are a lot of energy levels there that it can rattle down as you have to have systems that are quantized that don't have a lot of energy levels. They get hung up in their excited state with enough time to knock another one up before they rattle all the way down. It's kind of like a shoots and ladders game. Okay. And this occurs in quantum dots because by virtue of being very small, they don't have many energy levels. And so it's been shown in some systems that you indeed spectrally can generate two or in some cases three electrons per absorbed photon. Right? You're getting more of the energy out of the photon and less rattling down as heat. That's great. Uh, that's fundamental physics. Says that in a series of particles at high light intensity you can generate under some conditions multiple excitons. And in principle, if you could do that efficiently and collect them through wires, you could beat the Shockley-Queezer limit and you could get 40 or 50 percent efficiency. Actually, for this, the theoretical limit's 44 percent. But getting excited electrons in a single particle is different than wiring up a whole series of such particles and actually getting current through a device, which nobody has yet done. Okay. So this is exploring the fundamental physics of materials and you'll read about the breakthroughs in Science Magazine, which are important physics to know, but that's totally different than putting one on your roof. Another way to do this is to just make multiple colors. People always ask me, well, if, you know, one color is gallium arsenide, why don't you just put four colors on there like Polaroid film? 
make the top one absorb only the high energy photons in the blue and then let through all the other colors. Let the middle one absorb the green and let through the other colors. Make the next one absorb the red and let through the infrared and make the next one absorb the infrared. There's nothing wrong with that. This works just great. This is the highest efficiency solar cells. They can be above 40%. But because these have to be good crystals, they don't work this way. In fact, it's gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium indium nitride. Because they have to be lattice matched epitaxially, you have to grow them essentially one layer at a time. And so although the watts are high, the cost is astronomical. And these so-called multi-junction concentrator cells are $40,000 per square centimeter. Okay. So they give you three times the efficiency if you're willing to pay 3,000 times the price. Right? And nobody has yet figured out a way to epitaxially grow one such material on top of another without doing it in an ultra-high vacuum system layer by layer, which takes a long time and a lot of capital equipment and instrumentation. If you could do that, People are thinking about what wafer bonding, growing one film and then another film and transferring them in plastic and then somehow annealing them like bonding glass. And there are interesting strategies to think about doing this. No one's done it yet. Okay? But it is a route to, in principle, higher efficiency. There are other ways to think about high efficiency, and the other is well, if the sun is this broad spectrum and you have a single band gap device, why don't you just Change the spectrum of the sun. No, oh, that's an AT&T phone. I own one. <laughs> the way you can do that is, in principle, there are some materials that do so-called upconversion. So you put a material on top of your solar cell that absorbs red light, and when it absorbs two photons of lead, red light, out comes one of blue. Now your material's band gap can be higher. It didn't need to absorb the red. It absorbs blue. and you change the solar spectrum, so you change the rules, because you change where that derivative will be maximum. Such materials actually work, um, but their conversion yield of red to blue, so-called upconversion, is typically 20 or 30 percent at laser illumination when you have correlated photons that are very intense, but the sun doesn't give us correlated photons and it's not nearly as intense. So people are studying whether or not it is possible to build so-called upconversion devices that work on uncorrelated photons at solar flux. Okay. We don't know if this will work or not, but it's not impossible. Uh, okay, because of time, I'm going to skip this. I will just tell you, there is another version of a solar electricity that is called disensitized solar cells. The way these work is you use a material with a very large band gap, like titanium dioxide, the pigment in white paint. That has no virtue for solar conversion because, after all, it's sunscreen and it is white to prevent <laughs> absorption. But you coat it with a dye, and the dye absorbs the light. The dye then injects an electron into the energy levels in the conduction band of the solid because it sees the asymmetry. That leaves behind a vacancy where the dye was. It doesn't have the electron anymore. And then that vacancy is filled by something in the solution in a gel like a battery. This is like a solar battery that runs itself in sunlight. Now, this system was known for 50 years. And the problem was that only a monolayer of dye was efficient at absorbing light and injecting electrons. You could absorb more light with multi-layers of dye, but the layers, because the mobilities were very low in organic materials that would absorb the light, wouldn't effectively transfer their excited states to this electrode. They'd never make it. They would just recombine. So you needed a lot of layers to get a lot of absorption. But when you got a lot of absorption, you never got a lot of current. When you used a monolayer, you got a good yield of absorbed photons, but you didn't absorb many photons. What's the solution to that? Make a porous network to get a lot of absorption, but only keep a monolayer of dye at any one time. This is the fundamental property of what was discovered in 1991 by Brian O'Regan and Michael Gretzel. He's, I think, the third most cited author in the world of science because of this. Uh, and it has spawned a cottage industry among scientists to work in disensitized solar cells that have the same asymmetry that we talked about from these two solid junctions, but one of them is a liquid. And the beauty is that you don't need expensive processing. You can make this 
in fact, with um, paint, because TiO2 is the pigment in white paint, and the dye can be the dye in blackberry juice. If you look on our website or others, you can see how you can get electrical juice from juice. There's a high school experiment called Juice from Juice. And so people are now trying to optimize the surface area, trying to optimize the dye, because there's a lot of dye chemistry from photography heritage of red dyes and blue dyes and ones with the right energies to inject electrons into TiO2 and ones without the right energy. And you can make solar cells that have all these different colors and different band gaps. And there are, I think, now 10,000 papers literally on dye-sensitized solar cells. And there are actual modules that you can buy. Their efficiencies are 7%, but they're competing with an existing product, solid-state solar cells, that have higher efficiency and comparable cost. So the nice bad thing about solar electricity is the user just plugs in. You don't care where it came from. You care how much it costs you. You got to compete in the market. Okay. I could spend another four hours talking about photovoltaics, but I want to instead move on. So I want to talk about solar thermal and then I'll talk about solar fuels. And I'll keep solar thermal short. So scale is again the issue. This is a solar thermal installation. This is a dual axis tracker where you point this sunflower petal toward the sun every day at all time of days. You have to track it because you have to, with these parabolic dish mirrors, focus the sunlight onto something. There are two different implementations, at least. In this case, it's an external Stirling engine that you would heat up and make electricity. Or in power towers, like the one in, uh, outside of Spain and, in fact, um, ones to be installed elsewhere in the world now. Uh, you would heat up a uh, working fluid, either oil or a molten salt, like sodium chloride equivalent, basically, and get it really hot. And if you heat the oil up through a pipe, now it's hot at the other side, three or 400 degrees C, and then you can run a turbine with it and make electricity. So it's not high technology per se. I mean, it is at one level now optics and mirrors and plumbing in the desert. Right? Unlike flat plate solar, concentrated solar needs area of high direct sunlight because you can't focus the diffuse part of the solar spectrum. You can only focus, by the laws of optics, the direct beam. The way to think about the direct beam is if you held up a little pinhole camera or blocked out the sun when you're looking right at it, that you blocked out the direct beam, you'll still get light to hit your eye or your detector from all the scattered diffuse stuff. The scattered diffuse stuff, however, can't be focused through a lens. And you need areas of high direct beam insulation, which are deserts. That's why they're so hot in order to get enough sunlight concentrated onto the focal point to raise the temperature because this concentration, according to the laws of optics, goes like the square of the direct beam intensity. So you pay a severe penalty for not being in high direct beam insulations. You build the same capital, but you build the same capital and go down by the square of the direct beam intensity from one site to another. That's why it's only really economical in the Sun Belt. It is argued that this is the lowest cost utility scale solar electricity uh, by proponents of it. Um, there are, however, to my knowledge, no released contracts to see what the actual all-in costs, including installation and maintenance, are. And so you will also hear the counter arguments that the all-in costs of solar thermal are comparable to or greater than the all-in costs of solar photovoltaics. I don't think anybody knows for sure the answer to that uh, because, you know, PG&E won't release it. Nobody releases their costs for solar thermal all-in installations. Um, the most optimistic costs so far are about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And just to calibrate you, Coal-fired electricity is probably roughly five cents a kilowatt hour, okay, so three times more. And the growth of this industry is all, right now, completely driven by a combination of subsidies and regulations that say you have to do X percentage by X year, and some of them even have solar carve-outs. Not only must you be X percentage renewable electricity, but some fraction of that must come from solar, and so then utilities 
just do cost trades and siting trades as to whether or not they're going to do photovoltaics or solar thermal. If you don't have access to good sites in the Sun Belt, then you have to go to photovoltaics that are cost advantaged when you don't have direct beam insulation. If you do, then the trade is a little bit trickier. And then you have a disadvantage on large solar farms like this in that you have to build transmission lines to get to them and people don't like that and it's a million dollars a mile to build a transmission line. Okay. And the same, you know, I mean, you have arguments to try to get one into the California desert and then people say we are going to make renewable energy where we're going to endanger species, which has some merit, but you know, everything will have to have trades. The scale trade here is pretty simple. You want to get that three terawatts I showed you? You have to install one of these every single second for 50 straight years. Okay. Scale, getting you again. That's why I believe that a lot of the advances here are going to be in robotics, in mechanization, and that even if the cost comes down, we're never going to make a whole lot of energy this way anytime soon unless we figure out how to scale them and get them installed and pointed toward the sun in a way that a bunch of people don't have to do. We hear about clean jobs, that's great, but if you did this at scale, you know, we wouldn't have enough people to have enough jobs to really try to install them fast enough. Uh, there are, in addition to just heating up salt, schemes on the board to actually make fuel because it, after all, at high temperature you can put in just refuels that would go into a refinery, like water, and you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And at concentrated sunlight, you can get temperatures that will exceed 1500 degrees centigrade. And water just splits then, by the laws of thermodynamics, into hydrogen and oxygen. You don't need catalysts, it just happens. You could run oil refinery equivalent reactions this way. Uh, both of these have been shown in pieces. There's a system for instance, zinc metal at high temperatures in steam of water will make hydrogen and zinc oxide. Zinc oxide at very high temperatures will release oxygen and make zinc. And so you have two steps, one of which makes hydrogen, the other which makes oxygen, catalyzed by a zinc, zinc oxide closed material cycle. So the input is heat focused from the sun and steam, and the output is hydrogen and oxygen that you vent. And then you would use the hydrogen in lots of things, probably not in vehicles. You know, you could triple the energy content of biofuels by upgrading it with hydrogen and have a liquid fuel. That's just known technology. You could upgrade crude oil, do a lot of things. You could run reverse water gas shift reaction. So if you make a fuel, we'll figure out a way to use it without having to necessarily pump it into cars. Right? This is an engineering problem now. This cavity has to stay hot. You have to have molten flows of zinc and zinc oxide. They have to be confined. You have to get the gases in. You have the products out. The whole system can't have any optical leaks or it doesn't get light in. And it can't have any thermal leaks or it doesn't stay hot. So the leading work in this area is done by, in my view, Ad that should be a Steinfeld, not Steinfeld, Aldo Steinfeld, who's at the ETH in Switzerland. And um, Sandia is doing a lot of work on making Sinfuel this way from just using the solar heat with a Fischer-Tropsch process at high temperature. Same idea. Though this is interesting work and should not be ignored, in my opinion. You can find leading references to more of these things again in our workshop report on solar thermal. Another option is to take that high temperature heat and instead of running an engine is to have no moving parts. And there are thermoelectric materials, in principle, uh, that can convert heat into electrical current. In fact, they do that in practice, where the figure of merit, the so-called ZT product, needs to be three in order to have the thermoelectric material with no moving parts be competitive or superior on an efficiency basis to an engine. Okay. People are up to ZT about two in somewhat exotic materials at low temperatures. The fundamental physics problem here is that you have to decouple the electrons from the vibrations, the phonons. And normally they're coupled. And so you have to make those phonons very low in energy, which you use heavy atoms for, like bismuth. 
and you have to introduce gaps in the energy levels that you use quantum devices for to get the electrons to not interact with the phonons in order to maximize this ZT product. People are creeping up um, and you can see they're doing better. People want to do this for lots of reasons, not just solar, but also for refrigeration purposes, right? Instead of having to have a refrigerator with a mechanical freon system, you could pass in electricity and instead of heat to electricity, make electricity into or out of a heat or cooling cycle, run it backwards. They work, it's just that they don't work at room temperature as well as a mechanical system yet. Let me turn to solar fuels and then I'm going to allow some time for questions. So the existence proof is biology, right? I mean, nature does make fuel from sunlight. You always see the same picture. <laughs> I think there are only two pictures in the world. They all come off Wikipedia. Actually, I think Steve Long took this one in Illinois. Chris Somerville used to be here. Shows the picture all the time. You know, it is on a small test plot. Farmers that grow the same crops, instructed to do it the same way in real fields, don't get nearly as good a yield as the small test plots. It's the same thing as a champion little sower cell. It gives you a high efficiency, but you make a module, you only get half of it. So, grain of salt. But it does work. We know that. And you know, bacteria do it too. They make fuel like hydrogen with earth abundant elements as catalysts like iron. How does nature do this? The reason I need to go into this is because I'm going to lay the groundwork for what now a fertile area is in doing it better than nature without any of nature's parts. Of course there is a whole vigorous vibrant area of biofuels, mostly not concerned with the so-called feedstock, with really changing photosynthesis but taking what natural systems give us in the way of crop yields and then doing something to the lignocellulose to get a fuel out. But for our purposes, it's helpful to see what the fundamental properties are that make fuel in the first place. Here's what a bacterium does in a crystal structure that eventually almost won my colleague Doug Reese the Nobel Prize and did win the people that had a little bit better won the Nobel Prize. There's a membrane. The membrane has the so-called special pair of chlorophylls, the green stuff that makes special pigment that makes plants green. Two of them for reasons that I won't go into now, people believe. But the important point across this membrane is we've got to separate charge and again we've got to know left from right. There's another important point in that this is all organic material and we've got to move that charge from one side to the other through a bunch of organic stuff, which is low mobility. That means it's going to take a lot of energy to separate that so-called exciton across that distance in order to drive the whole photosynthetic energy flow of a bacteria or a plant. We know the energetics of that. And in fact, we know that it's not exactly symmetrical in this special pair. There's a left side and a right side, and they differ just a little bit in energy. And the reason they differ, Steve Boxer here worked out, is due to an asymmetry in the structure of the protein with its amino acids that is used to hold together this left side and right side to make that special pair. So the antenna parts channel the excitation from the sun into the special pair and then it has to find a way to tell left from right or it would short circuit itself just like the solar cell. And it's thought that it does that because the left side has a little different electrical dipole due to the orientation of the amino acids in the surrounding protein than the right side. We've already seen this because if a material has a different charge on the right side than the left side and it's more negative on one side than the other, the electrons are going to avoid the left and go to the right. And so it's believed that that's what makes the excited electron decide that it preferentially 90% of the time or more wants to go to this side and not this side. Okay? There are two, however, more important points from the point of view of production of energy. One is that nature does need two photosystems. Solar cells can make energy with a big band gap or a small band gap 
they just get less voltage when they get more current. But the product of voltage times current is always whatever it is. But with fuel, not that way. If you want to, say, split water, then we all know in high school you needed to turn the battery up to 1.23 volts or you got nothing. That's a law of thermodynamics from the energy and the chemical bonds of hydrogen and oxygen relative to water. Same thing occurs with making sugar or running ATP. You have to get about 1.23 volts or you get nothing. So nature can't run its solar cell at optimum and get 700 millivolts. It has to wire two of them together electrically in series in order to get the voltage needed to drive the chemical reaction or it gets nothing. In fact, we know evolution did this because green sulfur bacteria only have one photosystem and they eat iron as their nutrient. They don't make oxygen because they don't have enough energy in their one photosystem to make oxygen. We know other systems like purple bacteria do the other part of the process. And we know that the Z scheme, the celebrated Z scheme of photosynthesis, takes two solar photons, one of which goes into photosystem two that oxidizes water to oxygen, but it doesn't have enough energy to reduce sugar, ATP, or NAD. And instead, it boosts it with the second photon to get enough energy to drive the chemical processes of the cell. Now, you get half the current at twice the voltage. These are hooked up electrically in series, just like we could have done with two 700 millivolt open circuit voltage silicon cells that would have absorbed two photons for every one electron, half the current, twice the voltage. No sacrifice in power, because you just traded one versus the other. Nature had to do this. But as a consequence of doing this, there are some important things. Look at how much energy is lost to take that first excitation and then move it down that reaction center to get to the second one that then it boosts it. In fact, half of the photon energy is lost just in moving that electron from its first excited state here, 40 angstroms to here. That's because it's a low mobility organic solid and you don't have a strong electric field and if you don't lose a lot of energy, they recombine. So unlike an inorganic solid, when you can lose a little bit of energy and separate everything, nature pays a big price penalty on an energy basis. Okay. The other thing that nature does is it had to connect the two photosystems together. And the way it does that is it shuttles a molecule physically, a quinone, that is reduced here by accepting an electron from this excited state, and then it donates the electron here to boost its energy to make that excited state. And because these two photosystems are physically separate, that quinone has to physically move in the membrane from one site to the other and get shuttled back and forth. That's a molecular diffusion time, not an electron moving through a metal. It's a molecule moving physically from one position to another, and that's pretty slow. And that sets an upper limit on the efficiency of photosynthesis as we know it. Because if the molecule can't move electrons very quickly from one site to the other and you shine more light on it, you'll build up those excited states and they'll do radical damage to photosynthesis. And this is exactly why it is believed that photosynthesis shuts itself down at a tenth of the light intensity of sunlight, which it does. Its productivity saturates because it's designed to work best in the canopy where there's shade. And as you shine more light on it, it suffers more and more radical damage. And even in the shade, the so-called D1 protein that is essential to making the Z-scheme work, it oxidizes water to oxygen, is rebuilt every 30 minutes due to radical damage. And so a very large fraction of the energy that would otherwise be generated by photosynthesis is used to just rebuild itself, to keep itself running every 30 minutes. At universities, we call this overhead. Right? <laughs> Photosynthesis has a big overhead rate associated with it. Okay? And if you put bright sunlight on it and it didn't downregulate it and suffer even more radical damage, it would have to rebuild itself even faster than 30 minutes. Okay? This is widely underappreciated that there is, because of the molecular diffusion time and because of the energy loss, that is needed to separate the charge in the first place. 
The fact that photosynthesis saturates at a tenth of light intensity of the sun, and by the way, the algae people know this, and the way they kind of get around it is, I think, cheating. They just, instead of getting it in bright sunlight, they pump it around real fast so that the algae only sees a tenth of the light intensity of the sun through a slit before it starts to do something else. But they have to count the energy in the pumps to move all the stuff around. You know, you can't just ignore all that, all right? So, um, Photosynthesis does saturate tenth light intensity of sun, and it does it to avoid even more radical damage than it already has in the system. And on top of that, it does take 1.7 eV photons and only get 700 millivolts out of it, and then another 1.7 eV photon and only get another 700 millivolts out of it. It suffers huge energy losses in order to separate the charge. Those two things combined set a real upper limit on photosynthesis, the gross primary productivity at about 2% total efficiency. And real systems are less than 1% in all the biomass made in the fastest growing crop averaged over a year divided by all the sunlight that hit that area in that same year. Okay? But they store energy in chemical bonds or we wouldn't care. Now people have tried to take the pieces of photosynthesis and direct it to do something outside of a plant. Like Eli Greenbaum at Oak Ridge took chloroplasts that had all the same pieces in them, except that he short-circuited that second system that should have reduced NAD, and he put a platinum catalyst there instead, and sure enough, it makes hydrogen. And so he used natural systems at low light intensity with reasonable efficiency to co-opt them into splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen for about five minutes until the platinum and hydrogen hydrogenated all the organic matter in the cell and until it suffered radical damage and then the thing died. But shows you in principle possible. If you believe that organic living systems are going to have to be regenerated and you want to make fuel directly from sunlight, then it stands to reason that you might want to use systems that don't have to be regenerated, that are the same materials that we use in solar electricity-based solar cells. Okay. This works. There is a process that is as close as I can tell to magic that you will see, by which you can take materials like silicon or gallium arsenide, and instead of separating charge across two solid liquid, inter across two solid interfaces like a solar cell, make one of them a liquid, and it will just split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And my motto is no bugs, no wires. You make directly fuel from the sun. Here's a little movie of this. This is a mineral, strontium titanate. I think this movie will play, yep. And you shine sunlight on it and it's bubbling away hydrogen and oxygen. And you can collect that and it'll run for years. And even though this stuff is only white, it still already, on an energy basis, converts sunlight into chemical fuel at a higher efficiency than the fastest known growing plants. So we know it is possible to do better than nature did to directly make fuel from the sun. In fact, it's possible in principle to do 50 times better than nature did this way. Why aren't these systems everywhere? Well, there are three things you want, and I can give you two of them at any time. You want it to be stable, you want it to be efficient, and you want it to be cheap. And you get to pick two. If you pick stable and you pick efficient, then I can't make it for cheap. If you pick stable and cheap, then it isn't efficient. And if you pick the third, you get two out of three. So we know it is possible, but we don't have the pieces needed to go for the trifecta. Birds fly with feathers, 747s fly faster, and don't use feathers. It's not impossible to directly make fuel from the sun. Uh, I'm now getting into, in the last 10 minutes, things that are personally in my research effort. It's also true um, that if you have been following the Department of Energy's Energy Innovation Hubs, where our secretary set three broad areas of priority of different time scales, one was a hub, $25 million a year in advanced modeling for the next generation of nuclear reactors. 
Next one was a hub in energy efficiency for buildings. And the third one was at the earlier stage a hub in how do you with no bugs and no wires make fuel from sunlight. Uh, that was a national competition that the winners were announced. The one Fuels from Sunlight hub, uh, I'm the PI of that. It's a Caltech Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory joint effort. We are gearing up to set up a major effort to try to make this really work. I'm really excited about doing that. So I'll tell you a little bit about what the idea is. For single band gap materials, we have the same problem. When the band gap's too low, they don't absorb much light. When the band gap's too high, they absorb a lot. Uh, they absor so when band gap's too high, they don't absorb much light, but they're stable. When the band gap's too low, they absorb a lot of light, but they're unstable in our case. They corrode. So silicon, when you shine light on it in water, makes a little bit of hydrogen until the silicon turns into SiO2, and that expensive crystal you used in the first place turns back into the sand from whence it came. Not good. Strontium titanate, that mineral I showed you, lasts a long time, but its band gap is in here, 3 eV, so it doesn't absorb enough of the solar spectrum. So we think the way to do this is to take the clue from nature. Nature used two photosystems hooked together electrically in series, each one of which only gives you half the voltage needed to make chemical fuel, but stringing them together at no loss of efficiency in order to get the full voltage that you need from two materials that by themselves were not themselves individually adequate. One drives water oxidation, one drives water reduction. The other advantage of doing this is this material that drives the reduced forms of the cell takes electrons in photosystem one and reduces NAD to NADH doesn't have to be oxidatively stable. In fact, nature's enzymes are not oxidatively stable. They're driving reductions. They never see the oxygen part. Photosystem 2 does that. It oxidizes water to oxygen. It's not reductively stable. It doesn't have to be. It never sees across the membrane the reductive part. And of course you need the membrane not only to neutralize the pH gradient, but you don't want to make high energy fuel like hydrogen and oxygen in the same place at the same time for obvious reasons. And nature has the same problem with sugar and oxygen. It'll burn if it doesn't separate them. So our job is to do what nature did, which is develop a membrane with two photosystems, one that reduces something from water and or CO2, the other that oxidizes water to oxygen. We vent the water, we keep the fuel. It looks like bubble wrap. No wires, no bugs. In goes water and sunlight and out comes fuel. Okay, that would be a neat trick because we would solve the storage problem that otherwise you don't solve with solar electricity. We know the components of this have to have a membrane. We know we need catalysts because it takes two electrons to take two protons and make one molecule of H2. And because the solar photons are uncorrelated, those electrons will wander around independently unless we couple them to a catalyst in order to make and break chemical bonds. There are only a few challenges. One is that we know there are good catalysts to reduce water to hydrogen. It's just that they're really expensive, like platinum or palladium or iridium. So we need to find cheap catalysts, which we think we can do. The other is that we can't use these really expensive materials. The same cost per watt trade holds here as it does always hold. And we have to get the voltage needed to drive this chemical reaction or we get nothing. So what in the world makes us think we can do that? Well, we actually have an idea that is really reduced to practice. The idea is that we will use rods, like Mike McGeehee's rods, but the rods here aren't going to be the collectors, they're the absorbers. Two photosystems, one that is oxidatively stable, that absorbs blue light and lets through red, the other that absorbs the red light and is reductively stable. And this side reduces water and or CO2 to fuel, and this side oxidizes water to oxygen, separated by a membrane that passes protons, but rolled out in sheets, unlike the one in a cell. This looks just like a fuel cell membrane electrode assembly, except run backwards in the same way that a solar cell is the backwards version of an LED. Right? 
Now this looks crazy. Why do we want rods? Because rods have this radial advantage. In a regular solar cell, when you absorb light, say in silicon, 200 microns deep, it has to be really pure and therefore really expensive to get the carriers to make it all the 200 microns back to the interface to know left from right and then go into the solid and make electricity. No one's found a way around that yet, except what happens if you make a high aspect ratio rod? It can be 200 microns long to absorb the light and only a micron is needed to move the carriers sideways to collect them. Now, if you try to make a solar cell out of this, it's pretty hard because you have to make conformal radial junctions to every one of these. But if you make these materials and just dunk them in water, then the water just naturally makes the junction to all of these systems. Okay? In addition, this idea of using highly asymmetric systems, which we've done, we know it works. I'll show you pictures. Allows you to use really cheap materials like pyrite, iron sulfide. Second most abundant combination of stuff on our planet. Pyrite needs three microns to absorb the light, but as found in nature, it's very defective. Carriers can only move 20 nanometers. So only the top 20 nanometers would be a good solar cell, and therefore would be very inefficient, because most of the light would be absorbed where it would only make heat and never make electricity. But if it's three microns long and 20 nanometers wide, carriers can be collected by 20 nanometers to all the sides. Uh, we, this is just like a, we call it a photon forest, it's just like aspen trees. It's what nature did in highly oriented systems, where it is a long distance to absorb the light and a short distance to move the carriers. That's how it pumps water into trees. Grass does exactly this, but it's not all oriented directly straight up. In fact, maybe grass is better than aspen trees, because then you get light absorbed at all times of the day. So your lawn figured it out. There's another advantage. The other advantage is that platinum is the most expensive catalyst. It's also the most active on this log scale. But it would be great if we could use things that were really cheap, like nickel and cobalt and molybdenum disulfide, which people at Stanford are working on. Stanford's part of JCAP, a part of our center, too. Um, the idea is pretty simple. If all the photons come in and they have to make electrons that go to the plane, then the catalytic activity must at minimum be fast enough to push all these electrons back into the liquid as fast as they're supplied. But if you have a bunch of rods, you can use a much slower catalyst. Because these same number of electrons per unit time are now pushed over a much higher internal surface area than the planar area. And because you pushed them all sideways, each catalyst needs to turn over more slowly because there can be a lot more catalyst on all the side walls than there is on the one planar structure by the ratio of the internal area to the projected area, which can be a thousand to one in these systems. And since this is a log scale, you can see the factor of a thousand already opens up existing catalysts that wouldn't be fast enough to support the flux that we would need if they were planar, but this should work fine if they're integrated in this way. This actually works. I've grown these rods. They look like this. They're cheap materials. They're 200 microns long. They're 10 microns in wide or less. Long enough to absorb the light, short enough to move carriers sideways. Not only can we grow them over large areas and now on six inch wafers from a cheap process, just from gas phase silicon with no crystals, and this is a piece of plastic, we then infiltrate these rods on a substrate with fish tank goop, bought at Petco, and then we give it a shave. We just peel it off. And just like hairs, peeled off by a band-aid, our little silicon hairs peel off into a piece of plastic that we can roll up. And furthermore, we can adjust the thickness of that so most of the fibers stick right up. And now there are cathode material that we decorate with catalyst. And furthermore, what's left behind on our substrate is a bunch of holes that then we grow more wire and peel again. And so we use the substrate over and over again, and we never have to cut or make or grow a crystal. Okay. We furthermore made two of these pieces, one piece on top, the other piece on the bottom. We laminate them to make our cell like making a driver's license. Okay, so this wasn't totally crazy. Here's an example of one of these rods. We test them individually. This is in a piece of plastic. We've also made it in Nafion in the same proton conductive material that's used in fuel cell MEAs. It does make hydrogen from water. This piece does work. 
It's 7% overall efficient with only half the light being absorbed because in this structure at normal incidence, half of the light goes right through our trees. We need to tilt the trees sideways like filling all space on Southwest Airlines and we're working on doing that, all right? So you can see how this might work. Um, what are we trying to do in the end here? Let me skip this because of time. Oh, we're only going to do a little bit. We do have to discover catalysts. For instance, there aren't so many good catalysts for water oxidation. Now, it might be the case that we can take them and in a three-dimensional network, take a catalyst that isn't very active and hook them together in this third dimension to get enough activity. Um, but we're not willing to bet the house that existing catalysts work. And we're not willing to bet we're smart enough to figure it out. So we've also developed ways to screen, prepare, and evaluate the catalytic activity of more compounds in one day than have been collectively evaluated in human history. Well, we use an inkjet printer to squirt little spots of compounds because we co-opt the inkjets to feed structures. And then we deposit those inkjet spots onto the basically front panel of a plasma television. And the same connectors that turn on and off the four million pixels on your plasma TV turn it off every pixel that we squirt a different compound with our inkjet and we coat them with a thin film of water and we see which ones work. All right. And we can robotize this. And the idea is we are going to build the world's largest structure function library ever in human history of catalytic activity versus composition, and we're going to offer a Netflix prize to people. You tell us what to search for next, we'll give you money. All right? It's a good idea. So the idea in JCAP, our Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, is to bridge scales, to take these pieces, to build them together and integrate them, and then maybe someday, we told DOE in five or ten years, have a demonstration on a field of pieces that make fuel from the sunlight crops that are ten times more efficient that can be scaled with earth abundant materials. We can't do that today, but I think the odds are 50-50. We'll be able to do it sooner rather than later. Oh yeah, that's my little piece of bubble wrap. I don't want to go through that. Okay, so in summary, a lot of this can be found in that report. That report is still as timely and as readable, in my opinion, today as it was when it was prepared five years ago. You can interpret that two ways. <laughs> we haven't done very much in five years, or we were very foresightful and saw all the things that needed to happen, and it's probably truth is somewhere in between. But it's still a great resource, and it's referenced to a lot of other things. So I would really think if you want to learn more about any of these things, go there first. Uh, my conclusions are pretty simple. You know, back to scale, we can talk all we want about scaling up existing technology, but you have to actually do it. And we can't feel good about proposing 40 nuclear power plants when what you really need is three or four, 10,000 nuclear power plants, right? Scale matters here. And on the supply side, we have three big cards, clean coal, if it can be made to work, which we hope it can, Nuclear fission, if we can close the fuel cycles probably to get enough fuel to really support this scale. And use the biggest energy source we have, but it better be really cheap. We better get it to scale and we better store it or you don't have much of a use for it in the end. Um, semiconductor liquid junctions right now, other than photosynthesis, are the only proven method for achieving this goal. That doesn't mean smart people won't figure out other ways. Well, but it does mean this is where we're at now in trying to combine our ability to make fuel with our ability to make electricity, with our ability to take the sun and make heat out of it and then convert it into fuel or electricity somehow. So I hope in this kind of two hours I've touched on enough depth in these four or five different areas to give you enough information that you can feel comfortable going to the GSEP talks and understanding what people are trying to do, which was my initial goal here. With that in mind, thanks for listening, and we should answer questions until we're all done.
Hi, Greg. Uh, in, in your little forest there, how do you solve the recombination of the hydrogen and the oxygen? Ah, because the hydrogen's on one side, the oxygen's on the other, and the membrane prevents crossover. So we have a top and a bottom, and the top is only the anode in this case, it evolved oxygen. And there's two such membranes, and it was glued together. You only saw one of the pieces, because we are building pieces one at a time. So what you saw is you saw in that, in the, the real implementation, you saw rods poking up out of the membrane evolving up one. Then there are also rods poking down out of the membrane, evolving the other, and the membrane passes protons but not gas. And how thick is the whole thing, the sandwich? Well, our membranes right now are 10 or 20 microns. They're like 10 microns. And silicon rods have to be 200 microns tall. The other ones have to be 100 microns. So it's something you can hold in your hand, but it's flexible. You can bend it all up. We know our first implementation is not going to be the last one, right? We're at the Wright Brothers stage. We just want to get off the ground. Right. Yeah? Can you make any comment or observations around um, the black silicon technology? So black silicon is silicon that absorbs a lot of light into the infrared even. But light absorption is different than, excuse me, charge carrier collection. Asphalt absorbs a lot of light too, but it just makes a lot of heat. So it's not, to my knowledge, been demonstrated, at least I know publicly, on whether or not black silicon actually generates carriers or just absorbs light and is therefore any advantageous compared to um, just coating it with a black pigment. You need both things. Um, how would the solar fuel that you're suggesting compare to something like electrolysis? Right. Okay, so right now we could take photovoltaic cells on the roof and electrolyzers in the basement and hook them up with wires, right? That is the most expensive way to make hydrogen on our planet right now. Uh, there are several reasons for that, um, but it is just, it is very expensive. And what you do is you have two balance of systems, right? You have one for the electrolyzers, you have another for all the wires and all the PV systems, and then you have to connect them too. The technical reasons for this are that electrolysis units are driven because of the high capital cost per unit area of the electrodes to as small areas as possible, and therefore that drives you to high catalytic activities. So you need to pass an amp per centimeter squared, typically, for alkaline electrolysis or PEM electrolysis run, basically fuel cell in reverse, and therefore, you use expensive catalysts, and you engineer all the fluid flow and balance of systems to minimize the area of the stuff you built, right? But it turns out, right now, best would be something equivalent to, I can tell you, roughly $5 a kilogram of hydrogen from a nickel a kilowatt hour electricity would be what electrolysis would cost. Now, $7 a kilogram of hydrogen has the same energy equivalent adding the factor of two for hydrogen utilization relative to gasoline and internal combustion engine of, um, so a kilogram of hydrogen is the equivalent of a gallon of gasoline with this scaling factor in it. So it would be the equivalent of making hydrogen at $7 a gallon. Okay? And that's with a nickel a kilowatt hour electricity. Now if I give you solar, at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, it's $21 a kilogram. Except that if I give you solar at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, I have to size the electrolyzer to handle peak, but my capacity factor is only 20%, right? Because for the solar, the sun's out half the time. So that's another factor of five. So it turns out, right now, you can electrolyze water from solar if you're willing to pay the equivalent of $100 a gallon. Okay? It's the arithmetic. And on top of that, electrolyzers have been developed at scale. There was built in the 1970s 100 megawatts of electrolysis at the Aswan Dam because they had cheap hydroelectric power. Norway did it, their Norsk Hydro in the 1980s from two different technologies. So we pretty much know at scale the cost of what it is right now to build electrolyzers and it's in this ballpark that I just told you. So the issue is whether or not you think there is a reasonable chance of somehow with clever design taking something that might be 50 or 100 dollars a gallon and getting it down to 50 cents a gallon. 
right? So that's a big engineering gap to bridge, right? And I would argue that it sounds better to combine the two systems into one and to utilize only one balance of systems and directly make fuel than it does to make electricity with wires and another balance of systems that we know is very expensive to make the fuel. Now, it's the argument. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we talked about the scale up issue and we talked about basic science. So, um, do you have faith that we'll get that uh, fast enough? And what's what holding us back? Okay, um, so now we're getting into how much are you willing to spend in order to guarantee success, right? So, of course, people have heard me talk before know that we should be spending a lot more money on energy R&D than we are to guarantee success. On the other hand, I'll, I'll say we are certainly, I mean, I'm not squawking that we got the Energy Innovation Hub and have the opportunity to get 200 people for five years working on this problem. That will be a great thing. And there's at least a credible enough chance that we can do something interesting that I'm excited about doing it. You know, if, if I personally got lots of things I could do, right? I could go work in photovoltaics only or electrolyzers only or in wind or another. If I didn't think there was a credible chance that we could really make a difference, I'd do something else. So I think it's worth doing. At the same time, um, can't guarantee that we can have breakthroughs, right? The only way to guarantee chickens have golden eggs is to buy more chickens, right? Not, you can't force them to have more gold. So we need to buy more scientists to do more R&D, to hatch more golden eggs. So I would like four energy innovation hubs in fuels from sunlight, not one, one in each time zone. I would like them in all sorts of other things, in batteries, in storage. We should be doing a lot more everywhere. Um, if you wanted to say the probability of success is as high as possible, uh, but that's a different philosophical thing. It, the balance is, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do a lot. So you've uh, mentioned a great deal about storage uh, in this. And yeah. uh, I take it that you believe that we should be pursuing more uh, research and storage. Uh, however, the, with the approach that you're taking with uh, solar fuels, uh, is it you know, as, as you mentioned before, isn't that a much more cost effective or a much more practical approach than trying to develop an electrical uh, solar approach with uh, electrical storage? Well, um, I think at the big picture there's no difference uh, because I'd argue the only way we know how to store massive quantities of electricity is in chemical bonds. I mean, people say the grid has no storage. But in fact, the grid has infinite storage because we only burn methane in a peaker when it's stored when we want to burn it. It's all stored in chemical bonds in the first place. And favorite analogy, look, the energy density is such that you want to store the energy in one gallon of gasoline, you have to pump 55,000 gallons of water up the height of Hoover Dam. That's the energy of pumped hydro which is the only massive storage we now have. There isn't possibly enough pumped hydro resources to compensate for one day's worth of energy storage needed in our country. No less three days if you had one rainy day somewhere. Bill Gates did the number. I, I haven't done it, but he, his people did it. They, they claim that if you add up all the energy and all the batteries ever made combined, it would power the earth for less than 10 minutes. The energy density in batteries is 200 watt hours per kilogram in the best lithium battery. The energy density in a gallon of gasoline, the energy in gasoline is 13,000 watt hours per kilogram. You don't need to know anything more than that to know why chemical fuels are, except for the nucleus, the storage medium of choice. So I think one way or the other, we're going to store energy in chemical fuel, whether we make as electrons and then convert it into molecules or make it as molecules directly, that's where it's got to get stored. I guess to follow that up, I'll be brief, but uh, do, you, do you see hope for electrofuels or uh, fuels that are produced through electricity uh, and, and whether that's a viable approach? Yeah, I think, I, I convinced, so you'll hear Tom tomorrow. So when Tom, in his first version of the book, which I'm quoted in a lot, and it hot, flat, and crowded. He said, our future is with clean electrons. And because John Bryson and Edison, he visited them after he visited me, and they gave him the whole electron pitch and forgot one little 
thing about storage. <laughs> and I convinced Tom, you know, our future is in clean electrons and molecules, right? Because somehow we have to be able to know how to go back and forth between electrons and molecules to get around both distribution and storage issues, I think. So, I, I, so if you now read Tom's second version of the book, and he says it when he quotes me and stuff, you know, our future lies in clean electrons and molecules, not just in clean electrons, because that's only part of the solution. Now, now I'm, I'm wondering, how do you collect the hydrogen? Oh, we're not going to make hydrogen in the end, but we have a scheme. Our first scheme is to make hydrogen, but we have a way to collect it. It's going to be in the bottom portion of our bubble wrap. We're going to vent the oxygen. But really, in the end, we're going to bring on catalysts that reduce CO2 directly from the air, just like a plant does, and we'll make a liquid fuel. Right? So you don't, you don't collect hydrogen. Well, we don't really want the hydrogen in the end. But look, taking water into hydrogen is only two electrons at a time. Taking CO2 into methanol, six electrons. You've got to get six uncorrelated electrons in the same spot at the same time to make CO2 into methanol. And you only got to get two to make the hydrogen. So we would be thrilled if the first Wright brothers didn't have jet engines, <laughs> right, and just made hydrogen to show it works. And then that's not our last generation product. But there is a scheme to collect the hydrogen with a hydrogen impermeable membrane that collects it from the bottom and vents the oxygen through the top. And it will flow. Well, it's so, uh, what's the word, uh, it escapes everything, the... the uh... I know. It's not under hype. Well, there, there is a scheme that doesn't mean it is the end of everything, right? It's a, it's a step. It's a step. more. Yeah? Does, how's the membrane going to translate the, transmit the light to the other side? I mean, it's got to be optically transparent. Right, but I mean, it's, like a nappy on it. That's what it's, it's crystalline. So we have some membrane chemistry to invent. Now the good news is that unlike fuel cells that are driven to high current density that have to operate in an amp per centimeter squared, the solar photon flux is only worth 10 millionths per centimeter squared. So we can have much less protonically conductive materials that are perfectly fine in our application, and so we don't have to use the limited set of high protonic conductivity things. Alkaline electrolysis, electrolysis systems are just fine in those membranes. They work. We've done them there, not just with Nafion. So it's not a solved problem, but it's not bleak, somewhere in between. Is the only limit to scaling the solar intensity by a concentrator the temperature of this membrane? Oh, in our system, yeah. which we haven't built, this is PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, we have a couple schemes, some of them with um, little lenses in them to concentrate light, maybe 10x non-Fresnel, some of them just flat plate, some of them other things. We're going to build the four or five different prototypes and not know which ones are going to work the best. Right? Uh, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. A couple different designs. Um, and improve one or the other every year is the idea. Um, but we'll see where we get. Can you talk a little bit more about your schemes of uh, carbon dioxide reduction? No. Because <laughs> it's all on paper. The, you know, the, the, the catalysts that do CO2 reduction right now, outside of natural systems, outside of Rubisco, which is a really bad enzyme, that fixes carbon in photosynthesis. It's also the most expressed enzyme on our planet because it's so bad, nature had to make a lot of it to even get any CO2 produced. It's reduced into fuel. Is all, all, that's all organic chemistry. And all the inorganic complexes forming dehydrogenases are, are typically either very high over potential or very slow, or they make hydrogen competitively with reducing CO2. Um, this is a very difficult area that is just fishing expedition right now. So it's a, one view is it's very challenging. The other view is there's a great opportunity there because nobody knows how to do it yet, right? So we don't know. More. Okay, well, I'm willing to stay around for a while if people have questions otherwise. I hope, since I've never given this talk before and probably never will again in this forum, that it, <laughs> it, it at some level, had something in it new for everybody, which was the idea here. 
And you want to ask more? Why don't you ask more of sideways? Yeah. Uh, are you planning on producing uh, or releasing this talk for distribution on the net? They iTunes did. I don't care where it goes. That's great. That's great. So thanks for coming, and I'm happy to stay around. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.